Welcome to the SVG TV News for today, Thursday, August 10th. I am Kalil Cato with the details. One of the major struggles facing small island developing states or SIDS is not being able to access, is not being able to get access to finances to assist with their development, including dealing with the impacts of climate change. With this in mind, representative of the United Kingdom government, Alan Archibald, said they are working on several initiatives to help support small island developing states to access more funding. Archibald was on the panel on the Day 2 session of the Regional Preparatory Meeting for the 16 Small Island Developing States of the Caribbean ahead of the 4th Inter International Conference on SIDS to take place in 2024 in Antigua and Barbuda. The session yesterday focused on resources, mobilization, and concession on financing for Caribbean SIDS. I will say at the outset is the UK recognizes that the measurement of GNI per capita does not fully capture the development position of SIDS, and that's something we have made very clear in all of our interactions with yourselves and the SIDS leaders as well. We also recognize that bold action is needed to reform the international finance architecture, and to that end, we strongly welcome the initiative by Prime Minister Motley and Barbara in the Bridgetown Initiative and support many things that are listed within the Bridgetown Initiative, including those that have been set out by the Ambassador uh, as well. Uh, the UK is a strong advocate for SIDS in the multilateral fora. We have been using our position in bodies such as the Green Climate Fund, the Commonwealth, World Bank, IMF and the OECD DAC uh, to advocate for simplified procedures that are fit for purpose for SIDS to access concessional financing through the multilateral funds uh, as well. Uh, to highlight a few of the things that we are doing more specifically we launched a call to action in 2021 on access to finance, I believe, with Belize and Fiji, along with AOASIS, uh, to, to understand what was needed for the reform of the international finance architecture. And I believe colleagues are now working through the recommendations from that call to action, particularly on debt, bureaucracy and eligibility, uh, through our Friends of SIDS coalition as well with the names of having these recommendations available by the time of the SIDS4 conference next year. A deputy permanent representative of the permanent mission of, the, of Barbados to the United Nations, Carita White, outlined an initiative that is being undertaken by the Barbados government, dubbed the Bridgetown Initiative, to aid small island developing states in their call for access to global funding. The initiative puts forward key priority actions that range from short term to the long term. And some of these are, one, provide immediate liquidity report, um, support. And this can be done through fast tracking, the rechanneling of 100 billion SDRs, special drawing rights, to the poverty reduction and growth trust and resilience and sustainability trust. Um, under this as well is immediately suspend surcharges for two to three years and also restore the enhanced access limits established during the pandemic for the rapid credit facility and rapid financing instruments. A second prong of this is restore debt sustainability. And this comes in the form of redesigning the common framework, including by speeding up debt relief and cancellation with reliable timelines, debt service standstills, and most favored creditor clauses, and allow debt distress middle-income countries to make use of the common framework. Also encouraging the restructuring of unsustainable private debt through IMF programs that are consistent across countries and have more locally driven financial, sorry, fiscal sustainability plans. Um, also adopting zero cost, net present value, neutral natural disaster clauses in leading instruments, in lending instruments to make them more shock absorbing. That, and this was supported at the recently concluded Paris summit. The second, regional, <coughs> excuse me, the second regional preparatory meeting for the 16 small island developing states of the Caribbean wrapped up here today and successfully adopted an outcome document with comprehensive recommendations and strategic plans specifically tailored for the Caribbean region. The meeting began on Tuesday and was held at the UWI Open Campus in capital, Kingstown. Addressing the closing ceremony, SVG's permanent representative to the United Nations, Her Excellency Rhonda King, said the document is expected to play a vital role in the preparations for the 2024 conference in Antigua. This outcome document, which has been circulated and which we are about to adopt, is intended to serve as a point of departure for capturing the key considerations and recommendations of the Caribbean 
on issues of ongoing and emerging concerns. To ensure that the priorities of our Caribbean region are appropriately represented in the consolidated SIDS outcome document that will be approved at the interregional meeting in Cape Verde. Emphasis is placed on the critical issues of continuing concern that require the urgent attention of both SIDS government, stakeholders, and the wider regional and international community, with particular attention given to those areas in which SIDS have long advocated for special and differential treatment, given our unique vulnerabilities. In addressing areas of progress and continuing challenges, the outcome document also seeks to identify the responsibilities and commitments that we must make as masters of our own destiny, of particular priority based on our discussions and the consultations with member states are areas that might benefit from greater public-private partnerships, South-South and triangular cooperation and renewed call for the support from the UN system. I want, therefore, to congratulate all participants for their con contribution. Ambassador King thanked the delegates from the respective SIDS countries for their participation in the pre preparatory meeting and their contribution to the important discussions held over the three-day period. She added that it is critical at this time for SIDS to establish and follow through on new imperatives for collective Caribbean action in building their resilience in the face of the multiple obstacles confronting each member state. We have all worked together in a deliberate manner to focus a spotlight on the special case for small island developing states and the gravity of what this means in the Caribbean context, particularly for how we navigate the international agenda. Since the Barbados Program of Action in 1994, we have worked to raise the bar for how our needs are addressed in the international agenda first with the Mauritius strategy for implementation in 2005, and then the Samoa pathway in 2014. Now, on the pathway to the fourth international SIDS conference in Antigua and Barbuda in 2024, our ambitions and aims to advance must be even bolder, leaving the realm of recounting and responding to where we currently are and moving to address the yet unseen, unforeseen, and planning for where we need to go. It is emblematic of the Caribbean that we are not only shy to lead and let our voices be heard on issues of importance to us. We must therefore continue to advocate untiringly for appropriate international focus on and support for the SIDS agenda. Next year, the Global Conference in Antigua is expected to conduct a thorough evaluation of the progress made in implementing the SIDS Accelerated Modalities of Action, Samoa, Pathway, a significant international development agreement reached in 2014. The cabinet has approved for the second main contractor, the Taiwanese firm Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, OECC, to carry out work under the National Road Rehabilitation Project, which is funded at a cost of $120 million by a soft loan from the government of Taiwan. On radio yesterday, Acting Prime Minister and Minister of Works and Transport, Montgomery Daniel, said OECC has already begun its mobilization to carry out its work. OECC is going to be bringing into this country an asphalt plant and a concrete bat batching plant to help to speed up the process in terms of their own work. At the moment, they have eight roads assigned to them, and these roads are Magum here in North Inward, Grand Sable in North Central, Connery Estate Road, North Central, Manawal Road, that is in the Bible area, Peruvenville, that is in the Bible area, that Peruvenville Road. Equally, the realignment and the bus shed that is scheduled for that diamond area, that is under their watch, 
the Calioco internal road, they will be done by OECC and the Belair Middle Road. Those are roads that are assigned to OECC and they will be working on those roads. These are much larger roads with much more work to be done. And so OECC has these roads under their contract. Of course, this is just the first um, phase of, 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 of that road project to OECC. And um, there will be a second phase, of course, as the pre preliminary work. Minister Daniel said while the unit heading the road rehabilitation projects continues to carry out preliminary work on more roads to be rehabilitated, the Buildings, Roads and General Services Authority, Bragza, which is the other main contracting firm, has already commenced work on some of the nine roads identified that it will be working on. Of course, Bragza would have started work on the South Greenwood Coastal Walk. That is where some levels of excavation would have been done in 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 in, uh, in South Greenwood. Then you have, of course, some work started at Hatcher Bank. There's also Johnny Hill, Cumberland Playing Field, Noel and Sandy, the Windward Highway, of course, at by Miles Street. The concern there is because of the rainy season now that um, they have to be careful in terms of the work that will be done there, seeing that it is uh, a river that is at, that is present there. And they'll be doing also the Belvedere, the Belvedere Bridge and the Dorsetcher Hill Road. I, I want to say, of course, that outside of these roads, Braxer is still responsible for the maintenance of a number of these roads. The, the complaint has come increasingly on the Queen's Drive Road and the Vat Braxer to try and immediately see how we can resolve on, on this road. And so Braxter is supposed to be doing some work there very soon. On the work being carried out by the Q8 Dynamics Limited, by the firm Q8 Dynamics Limited, KDL, Minister Daniel again called out the company for its slow pace of work, noting that they have been having, holding discussions <coughs> excuse me, with the company through the office of the chief engineer, himself, and the ministry overall to see how best it can work together with its subcontractors to get the work done more quickly. They continue, of course, to indicate, yes, that they, are, they have increased. And, yeah, there has been some improvement, but the improvements are slow and painful. I want to encourage the company, KDL, please, let us just try and see how much we can speed up the process. See, I have now come to realize, although I've been told about it, but we're individuals as contractors, on the bid on projects, there is where you have great difficulty when the projects are being executed. I can only urge that Braxa, that KDL, sorry, continue to increase the pace of their work on the road. The National Road Rehabil Rehabilitation Project will spend at least 27 million of its total 120 million budget in 2023. The rest will be spent in 2024 and 2025. It is important that educators educate students on the world's indigenous people. This is according to history teacher Ronnie Richardson, who at a culture part held yesterday at the Peace Memorial Hall as part of activities to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, said if students have a clearer insight of the people of the world, they will be able to engage in cultural conversations with others from different cultural backgrounds. As, uh, as it relates to your identity, the history of every people is very important as it relates to these people knowing who they are, you know, understanding where they're coming from, understanding their present situation and you know, making wise choices for the future. And if students are educated about the indigenous people and the contributions that they would have made to their being or to their existence, you know, it will paint a better picture for them. Uh, it would also help them because I remember when I went to um, university, you know, uh, because I was made aware 
of you know the contribution of uh, the indigenous people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to our culture and our history, I was better able you know to to find my footing to have a conversation with persons from different culture. You know, so it, it really helped me because uh, I understood who I was when I got there. You know, so I was able to you know share a bit about me and where I'm coming from with you know outsiders. <laughs> Cultural officer in the Department of Culture, Maxine Brown, said efforts are being made to bring further awareness to students about the indigenous peoples, culture, heritage, and heritage through various programs. Our indigenous people would have fought long and hard for us to be here today. And if they didn't fight for us, we wouldn't have been here. And usually, if you think of indigenous people, some of them think it's African, but it's more beyond Africa. So we have African, of course I have roots there, and so do you. Our Garifuna people, a mixture of black Caribs and Africans. We have Indians, we have the Mayas, we have the Aztec, and the list goes on and on. So as we celebrate this year on the 9th of August annually, we get to educate and inform our people more on the topic of indigenous. As you can see, before we didn't know anything about Garifuna, but here we are now in the of Garifuna. They were of tall hair, battered hair. They were exiled in Baliso. And we didn't know that. We went to school. At least I can speak for myself. But how many people for me and my generation, I know it's the truth. We knew nothing about Garifuna. When I went to Jamaica, I got the awakening. And so I decided, when I come back to my country, I'll, I'll invest in it. I came from a teaching background. And it's always good. I always like to give back to the students, and so I, I educate. And since then, we have been bringing and you know, collaborating with the Garinagu on an annual basis until they're coming back. In fact, right now, as we speak, we have two facilitators at the Bethel High School investing in our students through education. So they're teaching them language, music, dance in a, produc in a production call or program call. Habinaha Garinugu. So we continue. At the Department of Culture, yes, we're not an educational institution, but the teacher and me bring it out. And culture's role is to give back and educate and inform and document the information. And so I'm proud to say that our Department of Culture, the Ministry of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture, we are proud to be part and associated with maintaining our heritage, the role of culture. Cultural activist and vendor Ingrid Lavia said that it's, cru it's crucial to keep the traditions of the indigenous peoples alive. Lavia, who continues to prepare and sell indigenous food in her community of Owia, said the younger generation lacks historical knowledge about their ancestors. Yes, I think so. I think um, because it's part of our culture and we are still um, using it today, I think that the children should know more about it, how it is prepared and what is the use of it in our, um, our daily daily meals. So I think, yes, it should be put on the curriculum and the children should be taught more about it because we need to um, let our children be aware of those foods that were used back then and that they can still use them today because we know today most of the children don't want to use those foods. Okay, They try to stray away from those. So we think to um, keep it traditional and to keep it going, we should really teach them about it. One thing I always say, I, um, I believe that our um, identity was really taken from us, but um, we can um, try to gain that back. And um, we need to teach our children who they are, okay, really where they came from and where we are heading as a people, because I think um, that is lacking. The children of today, our youth, do not know much about um, their heritage. And I think as older folks, we need to um, teach them and let them be aware of where exactly they came from, who they are. Because um, in my community, we have been um, trying to um, have workshops and um, camps that, um, where we can teach the children the music, the dance, the language of our Garifuna people, because we didn't need to know about it. They don't know much about it, and we think that is very important. For the culture to stay alive and to remain, they need to know more about it so that they themselves, after a time, when we are gone, they know it and they need to pass it on to the others to come. Another local vendor, Omega Sutherland, said the cassava has several benefits and was useful as a self-defense tool used by our ancestors against their foes. Cassava bread is known back, even mentioned in history book, but I don't remember the exact name that you mentioned it by. The water from the cassava, the raw cassava, the raw material, was used to shoot arrows. It carried a poisonous substance that killed their enemy. 
to the health wise cassava bread is known cassava bread affair is both known to lower cholesterol so a lot of people is moving back into using it from my experience um, going around with groups introducing cassava bread and farine more people are familiar um, kids are familiar with the farine but not the cassava bread and if you give it them give it to them to taste they would somehow say they don't like it because they have never ate it before and they are not familiar with it so they shy away from it I think so because it wouldn't just to be long but to eat healthy and to get familiar in case they do not have it it, um, it is not a custom in to use it in their homes. They would get used to it having knowledge. The Methodist Church Kingstown Chateaubriand Circuit yesterday handed out four scholarships, each totaling $1,500 and 10 bursaries at $500 each to, the stu to students for the 2023-2024 academic year. The scholarships and bursaries are awarded on the basis of need under the Church's Mission in Action program and were handed out by Reverend Stilson Cato, Superintendent Minister of the Kingstown Chateaubriand Circuit. Addressing the handing over ceremony, Christabel Ashton, a member of the scholarship committee, noted that the distribution of the scholarships and bursaries is an annual event where they award students from the various from the church's various congregations and communities. And from the first year, every year, we have given more than four bursaries. In the year of COVID, we gave additional bursaries to help parents, more parents because at that time, people were going through more economic struggles. And then after COVID, we went right into, well, COVID wasn't finished when the volcano started. And so we also got additional help to give more children as well. And we did the same thing. We gave actually a lot more children um, assistance for their uh, transportation and meals from financing that we got. And so we gave all together about 50 children separately when we looked at COVID and the volcano. So lots of children, other children, got assistance who we, who we did not make public as we have in a public function here today. So this year, we are awarding four scholarships, four scholarships and 10 bursaries. Why are we awarding four scholarships this year? Last year, we only awarded two scholarships. And it's not because we did not have money to award three scholarships. Now, our program is a needs-based program. Lots of agencies give scholarships, but they generally give to who come the highest. We do not give to who come the highest. Yes, you might come the highest and get, but that is not the main reason why you get. You get assistance because based on your need. Not everyone is in the same financial situation, and some parents have it have a greater difficulty than others and that we take into consideration that is our greatest factor there are other things we consider we also consider how involved you are as a young person in church do you attend Sunday school do you take part in church at the yes we have given to children who do not attend our church but for those who attend our church it is important that you take the church's scholarship program was introduced in 2019 with three scholarships and four bursaries awarded to students who were entering secondary school for the first time. The Parkhill Evangelical Church, a member of the Evangelical Churches of the West Indies, is celebrating its 65th anniversary as a ministry and its 31st anniversary since the dedication of its home sanctuary. The Parkhill Evangelical Church started its ministry in, in the early 1958 with Sunday school classes at the Parkhill Government School by local and foreign missionaries. The sanctuary was dedicated for the glory of God on July 26, 1992 by the visionary leader, Pastor Amos and Gloria Denny. The anniversary celebrations will take place on Sunday, August 13th from 10.30 a.m. at the church under the theme, Returning Thanks at 65. 
The speaker at the special ev anniversary event on Sunday will be Pastor Lennox Light Rankin of Guyana. As part of the anniversary celebrations, the church will also conduct a week of vacation Bible school for the children of the community of Park Hill from next Monday to next Friday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. daily as part of its thrust to reach the next generation with the message of Christ.